I want to welcome everybody here this morning. Good volume. We have a full class and that is super. It's been about a month since I taught last. We're going to go over a quick review and then move on in uh, to our study a little bit. We're talking about having a transformed heart. How to do that, some um, strategies on uh, how to keep that going in our lives as a Christian, as a new Christian, as an older Christian. Very important, we've learned, to continue to transform ourselves into what God expects that we should become. Before we uh, jump too far into that, I'd like to have a word of prayer. Let's pray. Our great God and Father in heaven, we're so thankful, Father, for all the blessings that you've given us this morning. We're thankful, Father, for the day of worship and for this time that you've given us to come here together as followers of yours, as Christians. We ask, Father, that you help us to be good worshipers this day. Help us to set aside all the distractions that this world delivers to us, that we may fully glory or glorify and honor you in the way that we should. Help us to be good encouragers to those around about us. Help us, Father, in this study as we study to uh, be better, to transform ourselves from this world to good servants of yours. Help us to be disciples, true disciples, following your word and your will. Help us to help others, Father, to spread your word. Father, we're most thankful for our Savior, Jesus Christ, who suffered and died on the cross on our behalf. We know, Father, that without Jesus, that there is no way, there is no hope, and we're thankful for the love that you've shown. Help us, Father, with the, the study this day. We, we're thankful for the teachers. We're thankful for the students. We're thankful for brethren. Please forgive us, Father, in our sins. In it's Christ's name we pray. Amen. Like I say, when I last taught this class, we're talking on some things that will uh, absolutely keep us from transforming. And these, this is our, uh, our main verse in uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Uh, we read there, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And that's, what we wanna, that's where we want to be, transform. One of those things we had just stepped into, thanks to a healthy review from uh, previous classes was pride. Pride. We saw as an example of how the, the ruling Jews displayed their pride in John 9, 31. They had contempt for anyone not sharing their views and, and it even blinded them from seeing the truth. Strangely enough, from a man that was previously blind. They said, they, they answered him, you were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And they cast him out. And we had just asked this question, and we were getting some very good answers. What are the origins of pride when our class last ended? And so for a short period here, let's finish up our thoughts on this one thing that can keep us from renewing our heart as a Christian. Look with me now as we see that, that God is the source, the power, and most importantly, the creator, our creator. Romans 9. Romans chapter 9, verse 1. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, 
And to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Here Paul laments over his kinsmen, the Jews, that seemingly throw away the good news of a Savior. Continuing there in verse 6, But it's not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said, about this time next year, I will return, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had, not, had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. And verse 16 is a key verse. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever, who, whomever he wills. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? Or who can resist his will? Here's another key verse. But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay? To make out the same lump, one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy which he has prepared beforehand for glory? Even at us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles? We should always remember that God gets to make the rules. This is when our pride kind of wells up in us. It's not you or me that can call foul or no fair. God call, he He's the definer of even those words. How do we dare say or think what is fair or foul before our great creator? This cannot be more blaringly obvious by the example of of the selection of God's people in the earliest times. Did God choose the Israelites because of their mightiness? Because of their strength? Or their fortitude? Or their witness? I don't think so. Can you read Deuteronomy 7, 6-8 please? Sam. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers, that the Lord has brought you out, of, out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Thanks. The, the Lord God loved them. His choice. Not their choice then, not our choice now. God's loving grace made them and he made us what we are. So we have to guard against spiritual pride. First off. And that's the first way we do that. Is we recognize that God is the creator. And he has given us salvation. Also shown in Romans 11. Romans eleven seventeen it says, But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, 
There's a key verse. Do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. And we'll come to that later. But you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you. Provided you continue, continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. The warning of spiritual pride is apparent here. In verse 18, don't become arrogant. We are the ones that are supposed to, not the other way around. We are completely reliant on our Savior, Jesus. So the other thing that we want to do to keep away from pride, we want to recognize God, who he is. That may be very simple to all of us, but it may not be. I think uh, we come across this when we find ourselves steeped in pride. We're like, oh, I need to step back here. I think it's a very um, base um, knowledge thing is God is the creator, but it's something easily forgotten. Second thing is we need to maintain our faith, and that was uh, talked about in the reading before. Maintain our faith. Just when we think we're doing so much for God, and we seem to be so much more of a spiritual giant than others, we need to remember Romans 8.8. 8. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And it is faith that is pleasing to God. Can you read Hebrews 11.6, please? And without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. And also Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 even tells us that faith itself comes from God so that pride doesn't pollute us. Can you read that? Okay. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And also we've looked at Romans 12, 1 and 2 at some length in the last month. But going on in Romans 12, 3 for the Grace, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith, that God, who? Who has a sign? God has a sign. Sober judgment. Our pride, our spiritual pride will blind us. We are to guard ourselves from it. If we need to understand... <clears throat> If we understand this, that's how our, our growth in, and our transformation in God or Christ will happen. So have you seen spiritual pride becoming a stumbling block? How have you seen spiritual pride become a, sp a stumbling block? How, how do you see that? Yes, if we think we're better than others, it's difficult for us to reach out to others, is it not? That's true. Yes. Kind of like the Pharisees. Yes. Very good. Very good. Yes. It causes disunity. We're not all the same. Yes. Did you have your hand raised? No. Go ahead. Sometimes we can trust in our religion than our God. Yes, go ahead. That's true. We can think we can do no wrong. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Very good. Very good. Any other comments?
I think this is when we see us at our worst. Our worst is when we have spiritual pride. Yes, go ahead. Where do we take care of spiritual pride that has labeled us us as Christians with mm-hmm. a bad reputation? Because, I mean, it's, once the pride has been you know, out there, our faith has come down off that off. Even if we do, people have already taken Right. Okay, good question. Where? I think you're, uh, you've answered your own question. What, the question was, what do we, what do, we do with... Uh, we're a lot of times always in damage control because of uh, our bad conduct because of this very thing sometimes. And, I mean, I might rather teach offensively than defensively. Sure, sure. But I think the way you answer your question is we, we, do the, we fix our heart and we do the right thing as an example. Go ahead, Stan. Parents make mistakes. <laughs> okay. <coughs> yes. Yes, when we find ourselves in this, it's the best thing to do is recognize it and to go and fix that the best we can. Yes, go ahead, Allison. Sure, absolutely. I, I like that transparency. Hey, I'm not perfect. I made a mistake. We made a mistake. He made a mistake. Sometimes we have to say that. Sometimes we have to apologize for our brethren. Maybe. Yeah, sometimes we have to apologize for our brethren. Yes. Very true. It's not making mistakes. Everybody's going to make mistakes. And everybody's going to fall down. But if I fall down and I don't want to get back up and I say I'm just going to play like it, that's a hypocrite. And the world's right in judging that way. Yes. But it doesn't make everybody a hypocrite. No. In fact, I would say there's a very important hypocrite. Sure. We don't want to be like, like the Pharisee. The pride of that Pharisee would not allow him to hear the truth from the previously blind man. You're you're grown from sin. Get out of my sight. They they were pushed him out. We do not want to be that that person. Keith, you had a... Well, it's one of the things that we have to look at, too. Uh, Part of our transformation of the heart is that we have to get to know our heart. Because if we don't 
they learn how do we conduct ourselves because we want to say we want to teach. Uh, Good question. The hardest thing that most Christians have is we have a lot of knowledge. And we want to tell people about the knowledge that we have about it. So sometimes I think we fail to listen to the person we're trying to talk to. You know, what does he think? What, where's he coming from? And, 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 and sit back and just, just this is what he said. And, and I think he's in his talk to scriptures. That's what the most because Philip went to the Ethiopian you No, know, he says, what are you reading? You know, and, and, and the Ethiopian went with what? Philip listened to what the Ethiopian had to say. For he never went in and started at that point. These Sure, we have to meet people where they're at, do we not? That's my, kind of my next, kind of my next um, point is um, compassion. We have to have compassion. We have to remember we all kind of came from the same place, right? From sin. And we all need to be saved from the same place, from sin. And sometimes we forget that. Once we've attained that salvation, we forget that we all come from sin. How about from being, here's a, a big point, being doctrinally correct. How important is that? Mm, pretty important, yeah. Pretty important. I think this really gets us hinked up sometimes. We, we would rather hit people over the head with this book than to sit down and to listen to where they're coming from and say, this, this is what it is. Learn it. Why can't you learn it? They're, they're just not there yet. They need, to grow, they need to grow just like we grew. Just like we grew. I'm not saying that we should not be doctrinally Correct. In fact, it's essential for us to grow spiritually. Ephesians 4, 13-15 tells us this. We need to be able to keep from being pulled to and fro by every doctrine and wind that changes. That's a rough paraphrase. Where we are puffed up with pride is when we ascribe that ability, that skill, that knowledge to ourselves. Once again, it is God that gives and not of ourselves that we have any knowledge at all. 1 Corinthians 8.1 now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not, know, not yet know as he ought to know. Notice the remedy here. Knowledge that puffs up. In verse 1, the remedy is, is love. The remedy is love and compassion. Go ahead. I was thinking about what Sure, sure. That's not an easy thing to do, is it? It takes what? Time? That's precious, is it not? Go ahead. That's a good point. That's a good point. Go ahead. Go 
racially Gentile. Yep. We're not Jews. And the whole law was promised. Promises came to But Paul's making the point. How <coughs> could we not have how could we not be grateful and share this news when we were condemned because we weren't born of the proper race that would be God's chosen people? And then God changes things as within his eternal plan so that we could be his people and be grafted in seven adult children of Abraham or his offspring. That allows the door to open for us. There's no way that we can have a sense of anything but compassion came from the same cut. Compassion and thankfulness. Correct, correct. There's a, yes. This center. That's true. We have to remember the compassion that was that was really given to us. That's very good, very good. Another, uh, I, I'm trying to move quickly through pride uh, because it's not such a problem. That's a joke. <laughs> but another thing is is comparison. Comparison. It, isn't it easy to look down upon those that don't know Jesus yet? Those, those unbelievers and to think we're so much better. And I think there was a statement uh, earlier said it, this, this causes disunity as well. Comparison within among us. We're all not the same. And we compare each other. The Pharisees were steeped in this and it did not serve them well. Romans 3.23 we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Not pride, but action grown from obedience and empathy should be swelling in our heart if we have opportunity with unbelievers. The spiritual pride that occasionally invades our lives is extremely dangerous to our ability to change our heart from a heart of this world to a heart that is turned toward God through Christ. We need help in guarding against it, and God gives us the tools to do so. Our faith must be ever-increasing, and we must always keep the salvation that was given to us by the grace of our God because of his love for us, precious to our heart. We should hold on to that. It should be highly valued, highly honored. When we do these things, we will respond in obedience to God, and we will see that there is so much work to be done besides bickering and comparing with ourselves. Pride is an ever-present danger. I want to transition over to our next subject, but before I do, is there any other questions on pride? Yes. Yes. Continuing on in Romans 12, she said, uh, past verse 3, talks specifically about this subject. Very good. Very good. Go ahead. Good point. If um, if you didn't hear him, um, just remember that uh, we are responsible for extending the grace that was given to us. Otherwise, we would 
be the same place, unsaved. And we don't want to find ourselves there. Good point. Good point. I want, I want to move on. Let's switch gears and, and take a, another big thing, look at a big thing that keeps us from renewing our spirit. Let's re- be reminded that our heart is a very precious thing, and from it flows our intents, our love, our actions, and even thoughts. And so we can understand that it must be guarded. Proverbs 4.23, keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. And also in Psalm 51, 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And so we want to keep our heart guarded and clean, and we've already looked at guarding our heart against spiritual pride. We want to take a real good look at the next big stumbling block, and that is unforgiveness. Do we have some of this sometimes? Somebody does something difficult to or, or bad to us or maybe people that we love. Sometimes that's worse than when things are done to yourself. If things are done to people that you love, you, you have some pretty bitter unforgiveness that is going to keep us from transforming. So first off, what does God say about Forgiveness. Turns out there's much to say about forgiveness in God's Word. Some of the most powerful verses in the Bible are centered on, first off, pride, but second off, unforgiving, an unforgiven heart, or, for, or the ability that God gave, or God uh, freely gives, is uh, forgiveness. Um, Sam, could you read Colossians 3.13 for me, please? Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Let's go ahead and read those three. Matthew six fourteen and 15. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And Psalm 103, verses 10 through 14. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. He remembers that we are dust. It's so very clear that God demonstrates his love for man in the forgiveness of sins. But it is and was by an incredible sacrifice. It all came about by the sacrifice of Jesus. It's a price that was paid that we are unable to pay. And it was given. This sacrifice frees us and enables us to approach God, our great creator, which is a blessing that's not easily described either. So what is forgiveness? Maybe the best answer to the question we should ask is, what isn't forgiveness? Holding a grudge, I heard from somewhere. Okay, holding a grudge is forgiveness, is not forgiveness. Let's look at some of those. Look at with me in Philippians 3, Philippians 3, 13 through 14, if you could read that for me. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Here it would seem that Paul is telling us to forget. To forget. To press forward. And he is, he is but he's, he's not telling us to forget everything that ever happened to us before we were Christians. Question. Very good. Good. 
good point. I'm not going to go into it much because that's about the rest of my service. So. <laughs> good point. <coughs> Excellent point. So he's not telling us to forget, actually. In the verses preceding these verses, Paul is referring to all of his religious qualifications, which, is, which to the Jewish mind of the day were of great importance. Paul then states in verse 8 that he considers all a loss. They're all rubbish because of, of the surpassing knowledge of Christ. This is where we have to start. Paul is making the point that no fleshly accomplishment matters in comparison with knowing Christ, regardless of how good or how bad we were before we were Christians. We all must come to Christ the same way, humbly, repentant, and certainly undeserving of his forgiveness. It is actually an impossibility for us to actively forget our memories. Have you ever tried that? i got to forget something. Where does it go? It's in your mind. You can't forget it. I mean, there's some things that we forget, but we're not actively forgetting those things, right? Everybody know where I'm at there? Sometimes you forget to wear socks. Yeah, that's not an active forgetness, forgetfulness. Yes. We're not talking about that. Our minds store millions and millions of pieces of information gained through every sense that we have. Those things that we try to forget, it only brings it to the surface. Paul is not advising us to wipe our memories clean. He's telling us to focus on the present and the future rather than the past. There are actually so many things I wished I could forget. The sin, the embarrassment, stubbornness, the hatred, the lying, the behavior that has brought shame. But what's the danger? What's the danger in forgetting those things? Yeah, we're going to do it again. Aren't we? We don't want to feel that way anymore. So we need to kind of remember those things. Not dwell on them. Just remember. Just remember. There are things we forget, but it's not on purpose. Forgiveness is not forgetting. How about... Is forgiveness reconciliation? Not necessarily. Very good. Very good. Forgiveness is of another involves who? Really just me, doesn't it? Just me. It involves me. It's an active thought or belief that I have involving another. It's me and me alone that makes a decision to forgive or not to forgive. The other person may or may not know if I've, been, if I've made that decision to forgive. The only other person in that that knows is God. God knows if we forgive and if we don't forgive. And this is important. But when we forgive, we've decided to take on that hurt or pain, or inconvenience, and do what with it? Just suppress it, push it down, give it to God. What in the world does that mean? That's what we're all scratching our head about. What does that mean? We either choose not to forgive and keep that pain to ourselves, or we forgive and give it to God. Let God extend His grace through you. Through you. Isn't that what we're asked to do? Is it not? We are to become the conduits of God's grace, of His love, of His mercy. If we hold on to the pain and the suffering and the inconvenience, then it will just back up and affect us physically. Mentally, spiritually. And what is so important to us? Spiritually. Spiritually. Forgiveness is a spiritual act. Which means I ultimately rely on God's grace to accomplish it. In fact, my own faults and weaknesses keep me from that. 
that will get in the way of forgiveness. But God gives and he gives abundantly where we fall short. Is this easy to do? No, it's not. it can get that way. Initially, it is not an easy thing to do. It's not. We'll look at why not. When the apostles were hearing this teaching, it wasn't easy for them either. Look at uh, Luke 17, verses 3 through 5. Can you please read that? Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Increase our faith. This was mind-blowing for the apostles. It's mind-blowing for us. Increase our faith. That's the answer. That's what the apostles asked. Increase our faith. Help us to do this. This is something tough. If I am judgmental and I am vindictive by nature in general, forgiveness will be very awkward and difficult. Sometimes that's where we begin our journey. If that's in our heart, vindictiveness, hatred, judgmental, we can't carry that into our Christian life. We can't, because it's going to keep us from being forgiving to others. If I hope to forgive specific wrongs others commit against me, then I should be practicing. I should be practicing right now this forgiveness. We have got to start this. To look at others with openness and compassion, to be slow to place blame, and to resist seeking revenge. That is not the life of a Christian. And sometimes that's hard to get over. Give it to God. Be the conduit of God. Who did Jesus die for? He died for me. He died for everyone. Let him do that. Give him that. That's going to hurt, but it is necessary. And we'll continue this. Great comments. I appreciate all of them. We'll continue this. um, I think it's next month sometimes when I teach next. Thank you.